welcome along to the Property Academy podcast. I'm your host, Ebert Knight. I'm Andrew Nicholl. And today on the show, we're talking about boarding houses. Now, these are becoming very, very popular. And so during today's show, we are going to talk about why that's the case and also what you need to know as property investors if you're considering purchasing a boarding house. And this actually is quite topical because not just because the interest deductibility rules which have changed, but I was at the Lion King over the weekend when it was uh, in town in Auckland and up comes to me a very nice guy who listens to the show and um, and so my family were all in the bathrooms and so I had a great chat (laughs) randomly while I was going to this musical about boarding houses in the middle of Spark Arena, so it was great. Did he recognise you from the podcast? Yeah, he did, yeah, he did. Listen listen to the show. Now, these shows, I must admit, just before we get into it, are always dangerous. And I'll tell you why. It's because I always think that I'm going to give up my current strategy and go and buy 50 boarding houses or something <laughs> because I, I, you know, because... Well, I thought you were talking about the Lion King show and you're going to say that you cried in front of Kelly or something. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, these podcasts are dangerous because I always think about it and I think I'm going to become a, 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 a boarding a house lord. <laughs> and the interesting thing about... The reason, I guess, why boarding houses are becoming more popular is because they are going to be exempt from the change in regulations around interest in you're still going to be able to claim your interest costs through boarding houses. But the definition has not been fixed, which is really important. So when you look at the definition of boarding house and you Google that at the moment, it usually comes up with the RTA, the Residential Tenancies Act definition, which is around the number of people who can reasonably live in a house, which is six. But... In some councils, and I'd have to check whether it's all councils, but certainly in some councils, you need resource consent for a property to be considered a boarding house. So even though a property may come under the definition of a boarding house under the Residential Tenancies Act, it may not have resource consent in order for it to be considered a boarding house. So we've asked for clarification um, from the IRD about whether, uh, you know, what is the actual definition in your eyes about what a boarding house is and isn't. We don't have that level of detail yet, but nonetheless, let's still dig into this. So uh, uh, kick us off, Andrew. What does a boarding house cost? So so we actually um, rang up Angela Webb, who who works with the agent that you pumped into, and she specialises in investments in Christchurch, and, and particularly these kind of types of properties. She seems to get more than, than other people on them. And she actually just had one, uh, which is under offer at the moment, but 60, uh, sorry, 76 Sawyer's Arms Road. Now, she can't tell me the price that it sold for, of course, because it's still under offer, but uh, the, the asking price was 1.17 million and the rent that was being collected now this wasn't being rented out as a boarding house it was one individual lease and it's got 12 rooms uh it was rented to a building company who had uh, uh workers staying in there which also would have an exemption of course seventeen hundred dollars per week did i say that already just doubling up, seventeen hundred dollars yep. a week. Uh, so a seven point five percent gross yield, which is pretty good, really high in the low yielding environment, certainly. Yeah, but of course it also depends on the sort of boarding house you, you're purchasing. Um, I noticed as well there is one that's currently being rented out by Venture Venture Management, our property management company, um, for twelve hundred dollars a week, also in Christchurch. Current value of that, if you're just grabbing it off one roof, which may, may or may not be uh, above or below what it actually would be, current value around 940 k So, you know, the same ballpark as that one which you talked yeah. about, which is being uh, being being sold for or asking price of just under $1.2 million. That one's only got six bedrooms, I believe, in that case, but still renting for a really good amount. That one's kind of uh, reasonably new, was built just shortly after the earthquakes, which is why it might have a higher purchase price in that instance. But boarding houses really they can really get quite large. For instance, I know Liz Harris, who is one of the, the, or I think is the largest female property investor in all of Australasia, lives in Christchurch, 112 properties, I believe. It's probably gone up since the last time that that, that, um, figure has been released. But, you know, she's got ones that are 200 uh, room properties in in Wigram in Christchurch. She's got one up in Nelson, which uh, the rateable value set in 2018 was 9 million. So it's probably worth, let's be honest, probably about 18 million. 
million, uh, given the appreciation that's happened in the market, these can get really big. I suppose the ones we're really talking about for this show, um, on a much more humble scale, I suppose, those kinds of 12 bedroom ones were, or a six bedroom, which might be more available to the average person listening to this show uh, and going going out and potentially considering purchasing a boarding house. I have noted as well, Andrew, that there have been times where I've seen that people have purchased motels and converted them into boarding houses. I've also seen an instance uh, that's got quite a bit of fuss actually uh, recently in the papers where somebody purchased a retirement home and was looking to convert that into a 57 bedroom uh, boarding house in that instance. So was you can in convert them. That one was in Christchurch Who was actually. doing that? I can't remember the exact one, but they've got five bedroom, uh, five different boarding houses around the country. Um, so, so really focused on that. One last thing before I head back to you, Andrew, to talk about the yields you can expect on a boarding house. Um, I just want to mention, you know, how quickly do boarding houses increase in value? And it's really tough to get the data on that because. Of course, it depends on how big or how small we're talking about. So I don't actually have any consistent data to tell you whether uh, these properties increase in value at the same rate as other properties or not. What I would say is because they are commercial in nature, it is probably tied towards the uh, value of rental increases over time as opposed to the value of average property yeah, increases. Absolutely. Because these are a commercial investment, so so the uh, what they're worth to, to depends on the rent that you are achieving. Yeah, so let's talk about yield for a minute. So on a, a high yielding product like this, generally speaking, you kind of see somewhere kind of seven and a half, maybe as high as 10% sometimes, depending on the particular property. Um, that's kind of fairly standard. And again, like you'd said before, often the value is uh, linked to that. Um, but you can often get that up through renovations. So if you've got an older property that you can, you know, go and cut it out a bit better, put a sleep out or a cabin in the back, um, really kind of increase the amount of rental income through something like an strategy, you end up with significantly higher. And you will find that these type of properties tend to just maximise the number of rooms you can get on. But you've got to remember yield isn't everything because there's additional costs with something like this. So often there's GST, higher interest rates if you're on a commercial term. And you will be, generally speaking, if you're financing one of these. If you've got heaps of usable equity in residential properties, then often you can leverage against those and limit the amount of uh, loan that you have on commercial terms because generally speaking you're only going to get 75% against that particular product I'll come back to that later on you're probably going to get higher than normal vacancy because you've got higher turnover of people if you're renting out 12 different individuals chances are you know there's someone going to be vacant at one time. Um, higher property management, so we would generally charge more for managing something like this because it is more um, labour intensive. And certainly as well, Andrew, if you've got one of those big properties, like uh, like take the Liz Harris example again, where there's a 200 bedroom in Wigram, Essentially, it's a hotel. They've got on-site uh, people looking yes. after the property. There are, that you're paying for cleaners, you're paying for gardeners. Uh, you might have a maintenance person. Yes, I know, you know that, you've got a proper staff. It is a commercial operation. I, I think from memory, Liz will often have someone within the complex becomes kind of the the go-to person, and that she might subsidize, subsidize their rent to be able to get them to kind of deal with the the day the day to day stuff, um, which is a great way of doing it. Furniture, so often a lot. Of these places will have communal areas that we furniture in there. There may even be rooms with bedrooms and stuff like that supplied. Sometimes the power, water services, that might all be included in the rent. If you're renting out room by room, almost certainly that yes. would always be included. And then, of course, cleaners, potentially depending on the scale. Again, if you've got lots of common areas. And insurance will often be significantly more expensive. So these are kind of some of the things that you, you don't have in a normal rental that maybe you have to factor in as well. From a lending perspective, so you can generally go only get a maximum of 65% LVR. There's no LVR restrictions because it's commercial, um, but 65% is what you get on commercial. So that, that would be normal even if we don't have LVR restrictions. The income's a little bit different. It doesn't go through your normal uh, servicing worksheet. Normally speaking, you net, the bank's going to want to see about one and a half times cover of your 
debt repayments. So take, for example, that property we were talking about before, if the whole loan was on commercial, and that would not be the case because you'd have to have 35% through cash or, or, um, or other equity, which I'm guessing would probably be residential. But let's just say 4.5% would probably be a fair commercial rate, a 15-year principal and uh, interest term. And that's a, that's important to point out. Uh, you know, if you're going residential, uh, you're going to be tested on a 30-year term. Yes. That 15-year term makes an enormous difference. Yeah, so the repayments on that are $8,950 a month, but your income's only 7361 So that's not one and a half times cover. However, the interest, if it was interest only, you would meet that criteria. So, so I guess probably for a lot of these people, they'd apply for interest only and then it would work. So there is um, some areas where you can be more flexible and some areas where you'll be less flexible um, when it comes to a bank side of things. And just to talk a little more about if you go down the commercial route and are borrowing on commercial terms, your interest rate, well, I think we used 4.5% here as an example, but often commercial terms are risk-based. So if you pose more of a risk to the bank, they're going to test you on a higher interest rate. They're going to charge you a higher interest rate as well. Yeah. If you pose a lower risk, then uh, c correspondingly, you can have a lower interest rate. And of course, there's normally application fees, and you don't get all the goodies. You don't get cash backs from the bank. Um, they'll laugh you out the door. They'll just they'll charge you maybe a, a 1% loan application fee as well. So um, commercial loans are much more expensive. In terms of the property management, so generally speaking, it's pretty much the same. You can use a property manager to take care of everything. And for something with just kind of maybe a couple of different tenancies, you might find that you're paying the same rate. As soon as there is four to sort of six tenancies, you probably will pay a higher property management fee. And again, as Ed was saying before, if you've got a larger scale, it's not uncommon to have a live-in manager. Well, let's go through as well some of the regulations that you need to consider. If you were going to go down the route of using a boarding house or setting one up, you do need to set house rules. And I don't mean this just from, a, hey, you should set some house rules for your tenants. I mean that you actually need to have written house rules um, by law for this. You're also going to make sure that you're, you, you've got every single person on an individual tenancy. Now, often these are actually... Um, more simple documents, uh, but you know it's just a different type of document that you would need to have in place for each tenant. And I think the other thing that's important to just consider is the type of tenant you might get if you were running a boarding house, and it does depend on the scale and how you've positioned the boarding house. There are now boarding houses which are appealing to young professionals and are near new or brand new and are really nicely kitted out. I think Didn't you live in one? Uh, not not in a nice one like that, but I'll get into that in a minute. Like there are some really nice ones I've seen in Auckland, which might have two hundred rooms, and it's basically like a really really nice boarding school. Um, yeah, if I can say, it, I went to boarding school. It wasn't that nice, um, but this is like really nice boarding school kind of thing. Uh, we can go, you know, live there, and it's cheaper than the alternative of potentially going flat again. Of course, not everybody's got friends who. You can go flatting with. No, they run it. <laughs> um, you know, so so I I do think that you, your tenants that you're going to attract are going to depend on the quality of your boarding house. But having said that, you probably do need to recognise that your tenants are going to be transitory or relatively transitory to compare to signing up uh, a family to live within a four bedroom home or a two bedroom townhouse, whatever it happens to be. People are going to move around more frequently, especially because these are often furnished or more often than not, you will be putting in the beds and all of the furniture and things like that. I do think that there are some boarding houses that can have some social problems. You know, so just to talk about when I was 18 and um, moved out of boarding school How many in years Auckland, ago was that? 10 years ago? Uh, 10 years ago. Moved out of boarding school in Auckland to go to university. There was a, a, a small window where me and my friend Leo, who we, we were very good friends at the time, <laughs> went and lived in a boarding house um, because it was actually managed by the mum of a school friend of mine. Right. And it was a, a quite same nice room, area. Same room or did you have separate rooms? No, no, same room because we weren't cost down to, to be down. Same bed? Uh, no, different beds. Different <laughs> beds. Um, I'm sure he, you know, he might have liked the same bed. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he probably doesn't listen to show, so I can make <laughs> stupid jokes like that. Um, and uh, <laughs> having said that, some people I uh, went to school with. Um, Flashbacks of Leo. <laughs> <laughs> Where did I get up to? 
you see that. Yeah, yeah, um, same, uh, same room, different beds. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, I think we only lived there for uh, maybe two or three months. How but, big's the room? Oh, it's tiny. It was really, really small. You know, this is like the version of my hell. Like if there is a hell and I end up there, it'll be stuck in a stuck in a um, two by three room with you on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... I think it is fair to say that because this one was a bit more run down, even though it was in a nice area in Epsom in Auckland, it probably attracted a certain type of tenant. You know, people who are going to be who are either on slightly lower incomes or they're going through a tough time. You know, there are a few people going through separations. Were they older people or younger people? Well, generally, you know, I'm thinking of people who are over 45. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And look, look, there is a hundred percent a need for really affordable yes. accommodation. But I'm just saying that you're going to run into, or you potentially going to run into. Um, a different set of problems than yes. if you're renting out a three-bed home to a family or a yes. four-bed home to a family because then if there are issues within uh, the boarding house, I'm pretty sure this had somewhere between 20 and 35 rooms in that place. You've oh. got more people. You're going to have more potential more conflict yes. between people and it's going to be your issue as the landlord. And so these are just some things. Did you that have anything happen? No, 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 no. In fact, they were very nice people. No, right, right. Like, I don't want to get, uh, you know, nobody no, no, I just came out whether it, wielding I mean, did a you, knife. Did you, use the, <laughs> did you use the common area? Not really. No, I can imagine you uh, so cooped I, up in your room with your Excel sheets going. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, you know. Um, but I don't want to give the impression that... Um, They're horrible. That they're ho- always horrible. And I don't want to give the impression that they don't have their place because no. they absolutely do. And it's important that we're providing really affordable accommodation and providing options for people, and actually, legitimate Liz, options. Liz, um, I know that she often, um, like some of her employment uh, policies might be that she'll give someone a second chance. So she'll have people that might have gone to jail um, or uh, in their seeking accommodation or looking um, for a job. And she thinks everyone deserves a second chance, which is awesome. And, and so because of that, She's had some amazingly loyal um, tenants and head tenants and also workers like caretakers and stuff like that. Yeah, she would have seen some stuff in her time, though. Hey, like she, if she, you've if you've owned some boarding houses for thirty eight years, and I know she's been in the game for a time, you've seen some stuff. You don't know about the stuff, do you? Oh, you'll have to tell me off <laughs> yeah. here because we probably can't tell you with that look you've got on your face. Now, we do need to get somebody on the show who owns some boarding houses. So, look, if you either own some big boarding houses, I'm talking like 30 rooms, 40 rooms, the kind of bigger side, um, or if you know somebody who does, please get in touch. Send us a text, 5522. I'm really interested to get somebody on because I don't own any boarding houses. Andrew, you don't own any no. boarding houses. Um so it would be good to get some on the ground knowledge as well. So please do hit us up if uh, either you or somebody you know owns some boarding houses. And hey, make sure you tune in in two days' time because we've got the third episode of the deal going live, and we've got uh, probably one of the most professional developers. I hope I can say that that, that I've ever met. Uh, one of the managing directors of Safari Group, which is a, a kind of a property investment focused developer, coming on the show to talk about some really interesting Quite properties. A unique really unique investor-specific products for the Auckland market. So make sure you tune into that. Just go to the deal.co, pop in your email address. We'll send you an email once that's live. Going to be really, really interesting to see that. And make sure you tune in for tomorrow's show because we have got the general manager of ResiMac, which is one of the largest second-tier lenders coming on the show. Going to be really interesting to dig into that. And I know quite a few of you have emailed me and texted me saying, um, please do get some second-tier lenders on the show. Make sure you tune in for that. Going to be a great episode. Welcome to the Property Academy Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Knight. And I'm Andrew Mitchell. And-